It is so important to know your family history. Just like people don't mind their family history with cancer or diabetes, we need to know our family history when it comes to mental health. I know it's an uncomfortable subject, it's not a warm and fuzzy subject, but it's an important subject and it can save a life. I had another baby, I had Wesley in 1983, and I was so, uh, extremely holding on to him because of the fact that, you know, I had lost one and he just became my, my life. I love my mom, you know, that's my rock and, you know, she's always been there for me and I know she, she is the person I know that I can count on in my life, like no matter what. I have a mom who went through a divorce and sank into a pretty deep depression. You know, in hindsight, I can tell that. You know, to her credit and, and part of what formed my consciousness around mental health, she did go get help. We need to find a way as a society, but even as, as an individual, you need to find a way to switch and shift your thinking to it's okay. It's okay to need help. And it's a good thing to get it. My biggest prayer is that people will accept that it's, it's okay to hurt. Because the more you act like it's not, the more you will hurt. And that is just a dangerous path, just a dangerous road. In high school, there's definitely a huge stigma of acting like you're okay, acting like depression doesn't affect you. And, and I think it's sad because, especially for guys, you know, we're told to be strong and, you know, that kind of culture of, you know, don't cry, don't, you know, play sports and you can get hit and get right back up, you're fine, rub dirt on it. Um, so whenever you're affected mentally, I think you think the same thing. How wrong is that, that the culture we've created that people can't raise their hand and say that, yeah, I'm hurting and I need help. Welcome to another outlet at home. Uh, I'm so excited that today Joe and I get to share a conversation that we normally would have over the phone live on Zoom for everyone to hear. <laughs> and so I'm so excited to have with me Deanna Joe Vivian, not only is she a licensed professional counselor, but she is a licensed and ordained minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Joe, it's so great to have you. <laughs> so great to be here, Vince. And you're just crazy. I just want to I, I, I am, and I don't know where this conversation is going to go, but uh, during this holiday season, I mean, of course, we're going to give the word and we're going to share just some practical tips about you no know, mental health during this time and our spirituality. But we're just going to infuse in some joy. Uh, we, we've titled this Joy in Darkness. And I just believe that, uh, you know, in my heart's prayer is that any person who is watching, wherever they're watching from, whether they're watching us live right now or they're catching us on demand or they're listening to this podcast, that you leave from our conversation today just with their hearts refilled and, and, and recharged. So, uh, I, I'm excited about our conversation today. For those that uh, don't know Deanna Joe Vivian, uh, I'm going to do this because I get to uh, the privilege of introducing her. Uh, Al and Joe Vivian serve as uh, just not only uh, overseers on our board, uh, but they are just truly, truly, truly dear people to Ash and I personally in so many ways and for so many years. And, um, you know, I always say this about Alan Joe, that the more you get to know them, the more you are in awe of who they are, uh, because they really lead with love and not necessarily with their accomplishments because their lists are long. So I know you don't like me doing that, but I need to go ahead and lay out um, just the credentials as to why we're having this talk today. <laughs> <laughs> are you done now, though? I'm, I'm done, I think. I think maybe some 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 more will 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 come out as as we talk. But um, I really want to hop right in today because we are in the middle of the holiday season of 2020, and this year has been one for the record books. From your seat as a professional counselor, as one who operates a counseling practice in today's times, what have you been seeing? Oh gosh, better question is what haven't I been seeing? Um, been seeing everything. I think you said it aptly when you said this is one for the record books. Uh, we all started off 
January and February, most of us excited about the year. It felt very prosperous and productive. It was humming the way our years typically do. And we had this great interruption. And when it happened, I think most of us thought, oh, we'll pause our lives as we know them for maybe two, three, perhaps even four months, and then we're gonna get back to it. And so we were living on this, this timeline that we created and sadly enough to say it did not pan out like we thought. And so in those short few months, the amount of people seeing me for anxiety and depression just catapulted. Um, mm. People were losing their jobs, losing their livelihood. Some people getting money, some people thinking they were gonna get money and it never showed up. So there was this fear of losing their lives as they knew it. Um, the unknown and uh, the lack of certainty was a big catalyst for the amount of anxiety that I saw in clients and not just my existing clients, but <clears throat> the number of people that I saw who were new increased tremendously to the point that there was no more room at the end. Um, talking with my friends and family, you could hear a level of anxiety and uncertainty uh, with most everybody. And as you know, it didn't stop with COVID. You know, yeah. we went through April and most of May feeling like that's all we're fighting was a pandemic then to be awakened to the reality of social injustice in America and how that pans out in people's lives and there was another bump in anxiety depression anger frustration and then we came out of that and really looked smack dab in the eye of politics and all that it offered and so what I saw in general to surmise it was a lot of people living lives with a great amount of uncertainty and feeling like their lives were out of control. And, and speaking of that, and I really wanna hang on that lives out of control because in our mind, I think we have a picture of what life should look like on a daily basis. We have plans, for instance, um, and even talking about in this season, we have a way in our mind that Thanksgiving should look, has always looked. We have a way that Christmas should look, has always looked. But we're in a place now where not only is it not looking like that, but there is a slight, and I would say this on the positive side, a slight hope that there's going to be a good positive change in the coming months and days. But the reality is, in this moment, things are not looking as if, um, you know, in the way in which we're used to. So, you know, for those who are having a hard time grappling with the reality of the today, of right now, um, we're coming out of Thanksgiving where, you know, just the families that I've had an opportunity to talk with, they said they had to celebrate differently. Um, already holidays have been tough in years past and we were so grateful to have you last year come and talk to us about holiday blues. So we know holidays, uh, trigger, you know, various emotions of sadness in those. But to compound on that, now you have people who, for their own livelihood and their sake of quality of life, are having to be separated from their families who are still living. Um, you know, for, for those out there who are just, you know, just overwhelmed with the disruptions that you, you've listed, as well as those who are in this holiday season who are um, you know, coming off of a Thanksgiving that wasn't like one in years past, heading into a Christmas that may look different. Uh, what are some practical things we can do to kind of center ourselves and not allow ourselves to go down that rabbit trail of despair? Yeah, um, good question. And I think the number one thing is, is that being out of control is not a bad thing. You know, we always have choice in life. We feel like we don't have choice, but we do have choice. And as you mentioned, a lot of people went through Thanksgiving without having the traditional menu, the traditional people who they are around, a lot of them not near their family at all. But when you go back and talk to those very same people, they'll tell you they had a really good Thanksgiving. Hmm. Many of them did things that they have not done before. They celebrated with people that they've not celebrated with before or celebrated in ways that seemed different, but literally, literally did feed the soul. But what we do is we forget how good something is and we're immediately down the road looking at the next holiday, questioning and complaining about what we're not going to be able to do. Isn't that and life? What well, not it? Right. And we talk about the Israelites and how they complained about going around the mountain and, 
and not being able to go into the promised land and feeling like God brought them out there to the desert just to die. And all they could see was what was behind them. They could never see exactly what they had right in front of them, clothes that didn't decay, food that never ran out, protection by day and protection by night, because they were busy looking either at what was ahead or what was behind. What am I saying? Learning how to be present and in the moment is where our peace comes. It's where our joy comes. It's where we're no longer anxious and we're no longer depressed. And most people struggle with being present and in the moment. But if they could take where they were for Thanksgiving and appreciate exactly what they got out of it on that day and live for that day, they wouldn't have the anxiety about what's gonna happen with Christmas. Christmas is gonna be Christmas. What about, was it the temptation to say, Christmas just ain't Christmas? <laughs> That's the one you love. Edit that. Edit that. Edit that. <laughs> uh, yeah, we do base it on circumstances. We base it on people. We base it on gifts. We base it on all these things that are really irrelevant to whether or not there's joy in your own heart and there's happiness based on where you are at that moment. Um, the moment that our life is dictated by certain people in certain circumstances, that's that wake up call. Mm. Lost the true meaning of Christmas, first of all. Christmas still is about the coming of Jesus. And Advent is still about the coming of Jesus. And if we can find hope and joy in that, it won't matter what our circumstances are. You know, you say hope and joy. And as I was looking at the Christmas story this week uh, over in Luke 2, verses 8 through, I want to say, verse 12, um, I saw the the announcement of Christ, the announcement of Jesus in a different light. And, and in verse 8, uh, it said that night, you know, so it was dark. Uh, the shepherds were staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. And then suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared to them in the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. And they were terrified. But the angel reassured them to not be afraid. Uh, he said, I bring you good news and that will bring great joy to all people. And it showed me, which really the, the title of today's conversation, Joy in Darkness, came from, is that when Christ actually came to the world, the reason for this season, it was at the height of darkness naturally uh, in their life. It was the height of darkness spiritually in the world and in this season where it might seem dark as you said it's not that we're looking for happiness it's the joy that comes only from Christ and I think with life that sometimes distracts us and certain situations and occurrences that, that we face and that we go through sometimes try to block our mind from seeing Jesus who is our joy um, it said that he was great joy and he still is uh, even in the midst of dark well, always. And, you know, happiness is circumstantial, bottom line. It can change based on what's going on around you. But mm -hmm. joy is internal and it's eternal. And that joy is Jesus Christ. If we change our focus, just shift just a little bit to what's most important, you'll find that the circumstances don't matter. I love the fact that um, it was announced at night. I think we feel like we're in our darkest night right now, mm -hmm. that there's no hope. Uh, people feel helpless and hopeless right now, but there is help and hope in Jesus. And it isn't this um, manifestation of Christ right here in the room. It's the manifestation of Christ in your heart that makes a difference. If we can stop looking for what's tangible and instead look for what's eternal, then you will find your joy. And then Christmas then takes on the meaning that it's supposed to have. And out of that will come happiness. So we're having this conversation, you know, as a part of our way that we do church right now, you know, due to COVID-19, or as some people call it, the vid, uh, we are... <laughs> Not around uh, <laughs> You haven't heard that one? Well, that's that's a new one I heard off of Netflix. I've had time in my in my downtime um, to, to, to get that. But um, others are having church service. But what, what can we do as the church? And, and I'm speaking collectively to help to integrate that spiritual and mental health component uh, during these times. Oh, you know, I think the greatest thing that we can do from a spiritual and a mental health standpoint is to give. 
if you're struggling right now with feeling sad or overly anxious or worried or concerned, um, if you find that you are uh, focusing on the future, what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my family? The greatest way to get out of that loop in your brain is to do something for somebody else. I think this is the greatest time to give. It's a spiritual principle and it's a mental health principle. Um, you cannot outgive God. So the more you give, the more he gives to you. And I don't mean materially. When we take ourselves out of ourselves and we look at someone else and recognize as bad as we think we have it, somebody else has it worse. And we move forward to be a blessing, to sow a seed, to water, to do whatever God would have you to do. There is a spiritual return and a mental return that can't be beaten. All of a sudden, you're giving out of yourself, which encourages yourself. And secondly, the greatest gift that God gave us was Christ. So the greatest thing God ever did was to give. So when you start giving, you're matching the heart of the giver. And there is a spiritual return there that cannot be bought, but only appreciated. So I think as the body of Christ right now, let's get out of ourselves. Who cares if we cannot meet in a physical be building anymore? There are people who are in underground churches all over this world, except for America, let's be clear. We're not under persecution like that. But there are people meeting in underground churches all over this world who would love to have an option to walk in a church or to sit and watch it via um, live streaming. Yeah. There are people who live in countries that just don't have church at all. And we're concerned about whether or not we can meet in a building or we can do it online. First world problems, most certainly. <laughs> we're concerned about whether or not the praise and worship is good on what we're watching live stream. When we can turn to a device and listen to Apple Music or to Amazon Music or to Pandora or whatever else we might want to listen to to get our personal praise and worship on. It, it's a ridiculous complaint that we have. When we have Christ in us and we have the ability to sow Christ any way that we want. And I challenge people during this time to find out how can you be the hands, the feet, the heart, the mouth of Christ during this Christmas season so somebody else can know the benefit of God's love the way that you do. That's so rich because you, you would think that um, when we face a year like this or whenever calamity or storms happen, you know, at first we get into survival mode. Um, and, you know, I'm not a mental health professional, but I can only imagine that survival mode causes us to focus more inward and, and to be self-absorbed quite naturally to make sure that their self-preservation is still intact. But from what I'm hearing you say is to, when we find ourselves looking at, you know, woe is me or this is going on, to kind of tap into that internal energy that comes from the power of Holy Spirit to say, you know what, this is bigger than me. And, and how can I uh, help bring joy to someone else? How can I sow the very thing that, that I need? And I love how you mentioned that it's not just material because at church, we, we have been good for saying, now if you sow uh, uh, a $200 seed, uh, there will be a fountain of joy. But it's, it's bigger than that when we are looking to sow a word of encouragement or we can text someone that, hey, I'm just thinking of you, praying all is well, can I pray for you? Things that monetarily don't cost, but they show that you care. And I think some of the, what I consider the, the uh, wealthiest people I know uh, are often people who put others first. Yeah, yeah. and you hit the nail on the head during this pandemic I would say there are three stages that people go through. The first one is fear. The second one is knowledge. And the last one is compassion. Fear is all about self-preservation. You know, think about the grocery stores when this first kicked off. You couldn't find toilet paper. Did I was wondering about, did, does COVID make you go to the bathroom? Because <laughs> there was no toilet paper. It makes you thirsty because there was no water. <laughs> no toilet paper. Listen. I buy primarily organic vegetables because I'm a vegetarian. I couldn't find vegetables. That's when I knew we had a problem. I was walking into Kroger and they were just cleaning the bins where the vegetables used to be. 
People were raiding any and everything they could get their hands on because they were operating out of a spirit of fear. What about me? Self-preservation is the first law of nature. Remember, we're talking nature now. We're not talking spiritual. It's the first law of nature. And when you get into fear, you start reading any and everything. You are passing misinformation. You don't think about anybody else. That's why you can take every can of Lysol off of the shelf for you and you, your four. What is it? Uh, us four and no more? Uh -huh. You're not thinking about anybody else. And then we moved into a phase called knowledge. And that's when we started listening to the science. We even started listening to Holy Spirit. Now, God wasn't taken by surprise in any of this. Like this is not the first pandemic that we have seen in the history of the world. And God knows exactly how to maneuver in one. Surprise. <laughs> And so people started listening to Holy Spirit, started operating out of wisdom and not fear. There's still a place for wisdom. There's also a place for faith. They started passing information that uplifted instead of making people afraid, began coming out of their house in more wise ways, and then stopped taking everything off of the shelves. And then finally, we've moved into compassion. And that's literally when we start seeing the needs of other people. So when I go to the grocery store and I see that there is toilet paper, not only am I getting a pack of toilet paper for me, but I'm thinking about my neighbor who may not get out as often as I do and I'm picking up one for them. Or better yet, if there's nobody else for me to get one for, I'm not trying to swipe everyone that's on the shelf. I'm remembering that somebody else behind me might need toilet paper. I start calling people. Just asking, how are you? Is there anything that you need or anything that I can do for you? Um, so I'm a, a Costco shopper. And I have been able on two occasions to go to Costco and get Lysol. Ooh, big business, right? Now it's only me. I need to go. Right? <laughs> it's only me and my husband in my house. How much Lysol can I use? Yeah, I wasn't talking about Costco. I was talking about your house. I'm coming over there. <laughs> <laughs> so what did I do? I started giving it to the more senior people in my life who don't get out as much and probably shouldn't get out as much. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing drive-by Lysol stops and giving people Lysol. It made me feel so in touch with God. It's what he does. He gives. He looks for the needs of others, not just for the needs of himself. And it made me just realize that we can make it through this thing if we all just work together and trust God in the process. So moving through those stages has helped us tremendously. I think as a whole, we waffle somewhere between the knowledge and the compassion. Um, mm -hmm. Now that the numbers have spiked a little bit, you see a few people running back to um, the fear side, but I can still find things on my shelf. So I, I'm feeling a little bit better this go around than we did in, in March and April. I was, that was extremely enlightening fear knowledge then compassion and, and causing us to look beyond ourselves. Um, we could continue talking just the two of us uh, which we uh, pretty much do at least once a week for a few hours um, but we're not going to keep everyone here for a few hours so I kind of want to uh, as we land the plane as I call it um, if there's just an encouraging word that you have for those who are watching um, just here in our community we have people experiencing uh, just working through COVID, some have, you know, uh, overcome COVID-19. Others have lost loved ones, family members, jobs. Uh, just, you know, marriages are kind of on the brink right now. They've been home and, you know, it's just been kind of, it's, it's been one of those years. Um, as we close out this year and, and prepare our hearts uh, this year, or really in the coming year, we're going to extend our season of prayer from 21 days to 31 days. I really believe that God is calling us to dedicate the first month, the priority, the top of our year to him and, and seeking his face. But as we head into that season, uh, because, you know, I just, by the spirit of God, sent some people out here saying, listen, I need an answer. I need somebody to tell me something. Um, you know, what could you uh, share with them? And after you're, you're done sharing with them, what you're going to share with them, if you would just close us out in prayer today. I can do that. Uh, first of all, you know, it, it can be and, and or feel so cliche-ish to say that you have all that you need if you have Jesus. But it's not a cliche. 
It really is true. Um, one of the things I love about God is that he says we can come to him naked or boldly or honestly. And a lot of times we come to God with our cliche prayers and we miss the power that he has available to us. So I encourage everyone who's listening to this to first and foremost, be honest with God with where you are. If you're afraid, tell him so. If you're hungry, let him know. If you feel like your marriage is on the brinks and you may not want to stay in that marriage anymore, let him know. If you want to quit your job or you've been fired and you are concerned about where your next meal is coming from, let him know. It is in your vulnerability that God is most powerful. He said, where you're weak, then he is made strong. Moving beyond that though, I wanna remind you that we will make it through COVID without a shadow of a doubt. The question is, what will it make of you? And this is when you sit down and you start doing that real hard soul searching. I ask my clients all the time, well, how much time have you spent with yourself? And they usually think I mean by yourself. Not what I mean at all, literally with yourself, TV, music off, no one with you, notepad and pencil in hand, listening to what's in your heart, what's in your mind, writing it down, being true and honest, no filter, and getting to the real you, then you'll find out exactly what COVID is making of you. And remember, it's never too late to make a change. It is not over until it is over. Whatever you decide to do with your life, whatever direction you decide to go in, you are not alone. There is always help, not just spiritually, but in the natural. Quite often, we don't ask for help. We won't say to someone, I feel like I'm about to fall apart. But this is the time where you talk honestly and truthfully, not only to God, but with your friends and with your family. Your answer is only six degrees away, I promise you. And with that, remember to stay present and in the moment. Tomorrow is not here yet. Yesterday is gone. I like to say it like this. Tomorrow is a promissory note. Yesterday is a canceled check. And today is cash money. I'd rather have cash money any old day. Find what brings you joy in the moment. It's there. Think about what you really are thankful for and appreciate it. And then lastly, if you're by yourself, make new memories. <laughs> Develop new traditions. No one says that you have to be with somebody for you to be happy and to find joy. This is temporary. And while it's temporary, it can still be very fruitful and strengthening and direction giving for you and your life. With that, keep hope alive. Hope is so therapeutic. It's so strengthening. Don't lose your hope. And if you find that your hope is getting weak, I encourage you to turn to the word of God and turn to those who you know have your best interest at heart. Iron will always sharpen iron. And with that, let's close in prayer. Father, it's in the name of Jesus that we just thank you for this opportunity to come together to talk freely, honestly, and openly about you, your power, where we are, and your promises in our lives. Father, we know no two circumstances are the same, but God, no matter how complicated they may seem, you have an answer. And so I am asking you in these trying times, Lord, speak clearly into the hearts of those who call on your name. Give them wisdom and clear direction in these dark times and remind them no matter how dark it might seem right now, there is always a light at the end of the tunnel called Jesus. And so throughout this Christmas and beyond, Lord, we put our focus on you. We trust in you. And we make a commitment to be the hands, the feet, the heart, the mouth of Christ during these times that somebody else's life can be blessed just as ours. It is in the sweet name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. 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 And there was some information that came up on the screen. Just if you prayed with us, uh, feel free to call, to text us uh, at 770-667-4899. Again, it's 770-667-4899. And simply say, I prayed with you, uh, myself, and one of our team members. 
I would love to follow up with you just to walk in this journey of life with you. I want to thank uh, Deanna Joe Vivian for joining us today. I want to thank you all for watching along with us. Uh, just feel free to share this, to listen to this over, over and over again. I pray that you took outstanding and copious, you like that big word, notes uh, on today. Um, my heart was, was definitely encouraged. And so I want to invite you all.